you all, and thank you for joining us. My name is Susan Lee. I'm the Information and Guidance Branch Coordinator for COVID-19 at the Central County Health Department. And we're glad that you could join us. We have today a, a list of uh, topics to present to our long-term care facilities and adult care homes in the county. And uh, today's presentation will cover guidance on establishing a plan for reopening, for visitation, testing, sampling, sort of agency recommendations and requirements, and other things. Uh, you see a list of topics we'll be covering. Following the presentation, there will be a Q&A and uh, conversation and session opportunity. In, in the meantime, anyone with questions or comments could enter those into the chat box and we'll be responding to them following the meeting. And uh, I'd like to introduce today's presenters. We have with us, Annette Graham. She is the Executive Director, Central Plains Area Agency on Aging. And we have Kaylee Hervey, all right, or, and she's our Epidemiology Program Manager for the Sedgwick County Health Department. And yes. also, I also would like to introduce joining us today as our guest, um, we have Dr. Min. He's our Central County Health Officer. And we have Adrian Byrne. She's our Health Director for the Central County Health Department. And we also have our Director, Christine Stewart, of the Central County Health Department, who is here today as well. So at this point, we're glad you could be here and look forward to receiving your comments and questions following the presentation. And I'd like to turn this over. I think we're going to start with the next slide. Uh, looks like I think it's going to be on the facility plan oh, and our in the introduction. And I didn't know if our um, someone from our health department wanted just to uh, follow up on this slide that talks about the uh, guidance in place of the requirement of having your plan reviewed. Yes. Hi, everybody. This is Adrian Byrne, the health director. So I, I know that uh, we all found out on the same call that all of you needed to have your plans reviewed by the our health officer, Dr. Menz, and uh, we're not going to be signing off on plans. I mean, there's a lot of specific guidance from uh, CMS already and we're going to be reviewing some of that, as well as Center for Disease Control. And um, you already have strong ideas and for how you're operating your facility. And I imagine likely uh, plans or ideas if you don't have plans for reopening. So we wanted just to review the CMS guidelines and CDC and uh, give you opportunities to ask questions. Uh, and if you, you know, have specific questions later about your plan, you know, we can definitely um, review those. But this is what we want to say to be for you is if everyone can mute their lines. And so we really wanted wanted to place of that for you that this is your review. Uh, because we will be reviewing the guidelines. And then we'll have uh, information online that we'll create. Then other things online that uh, you can reference if you like. And then anyone that possibly is not able to be on the call today can also reference. Thank you, Adrian, for mentioning that. It will be available on our social media site the recording the slide. Okay, so with the uh, next slide of uh, facility plans, we're going to ask Annette if she wants to present this.
Okay, so for facility plans, KDAS does require that a uh, the Department of Aging and Disability Services does require that a facilities plan include a phased approach to reopening, and that needs to be developed in collaboration with local county health officials. And as Adrian mentioned, that is what we're doing today. Uh, it must contain a testing and cohorting plan. And today's webinar and garden, as I said, replace the requirement for an actual review prior to the reopening. So your facility plan can be kept on record at the facility. You can have those available upon request to all federal, state, and local officials. Not required to be approved by KDAS or the county health officer. And they will not collect it or store it in a central repository. You just need to keep those on file for yourself. So when consulting with the local health officer, Facilities can document the method that the interaction occurred. So you do need to have something on file that shows that this was. So the email about this. So as KDAT does look what's acceptable, you can retain records of the meetings, including email, fax, and telecommunication documentation. We have our epidemiology program manager presenting the uh, statistical and technical part of the program. Yes, hello everyone. My name is Kaylee, and I um, am the epidemiology manager here for the health department. So, as of noon-ish today, there are over two million uh, cases in the United States of COVID-19. Uh, Fourteen thousand, almost fifteen thousand now cases in Kansas and Sedgwick County. We have uh, one thousand two hundred and eight cases. For Sedgwick County specifically, we have six hundred and seventy-nine people who have recovered. We've had twenty-eight deaths. And we have uh, 14 clusters of cases, and that was as of noon yesterday. So when we look at um, services for the, the health department, or that the health department can provide for COVID-19, anyone in Sedgwick County um, who meets specific guidelines can be tested at no charge. Um, this needs to be updated slightly, but uh, we did switch to um, anyone who has symptoms or meets a priority area, so anyone who works in your facilities as long-term care facilities would still be allowed to be tested um, at Sedgwick County through the health department regardless of their symptoms, and they could be tested weekly if they choose. If a staff or a resident tests positive in your facility, then we're uh, going to require that everyone be tested, and again, we as the health department will assist you with that testing, and we can come out and assist with testing of residents and then work with your staff to be tested through 211. And again, that is if you have a case in your facility. Additionally, if your facility does need uh, personal protective equipment or PPE, they can request that from the Cedric County Emergency Operations Center. And they will do that um, via this website through an online uh, resource request. However, you have to complete a burn rate form by noon each Tuesday before the EOC will issue a new PPE request for you. So a burn rate is just going to be the amount of uh, PPE that you are using in your facility. So think how many masks you're using, how many gloves. Um, so you have to complete that using that survey uh, at the link that Susan's provided before they will issue you any PPE. Um, you can also uh, work Get your N95 respirators decontaminated um, at no cost to you. However, if they do contain makeup, then they will not be able to be decontaminated. And so essentially your staff should refrain from wearing, refrain from wearing makeup while wearing an N95 respirator if you are planning to decontaminate those. Really, I, I didn't include on there where they get this done. I didn't uh, reference that. You can reach out to the Emergency Operations Center as well for, Thank you. for this um, service, and they can assist you with kind of that process. Now, again, if your staff want to be tested, they can dial 211 and then tell the operator that they work in a long-term care facility or adult care home and they will be transferred to Sedgwick County for um, scheduling of that testing. Our recommendations for your facility, if you do have staff that have symptoms, that they should not go to work until they have their test results back. If they do not have symptoms, they are allowed to continue to work. 
but they need to practice social distancing and wear a mask at all times. If somebody does test positive, they are required to stay at home, isolated from others, until 72 hours after their symptoms stop or 10 days after their symptoms start, whichever is longer. If the person happens in, um, does not have symptoms but tests positive, then they must stay at home in isolation for 10 days after they were sampled before they can return to work. So when somebody does test positive, the health department staff calls the uh, case to discuss, you know, where they could have gotten it, symptoms, um, and also we look into who they could have spread it to. And we are going to look at the two days before they had symptoms start or their two days before testing if they're asymptomatic and look at all the people they were around from that point on and get those contact information to follow up with them and provide any potential quarantine instructions. If an exposure to a confirmed COVID-19 case does occur and staff is in quarantine, then the staff should be tested about seven days after exposure. That's kind of the optimal time to uh, have enough of a viral load to test positive. And persons during uh, quarantine, if they do test negative, they must remain in quarantine for 14 days from last exposure to a COVID-19 case. Um, there are some exceptions for essential workers, um, such as healthcare, but we would discuss that with you kind of on a facility by facility basis if that occurred. So when we look at um, how Sedgwick County is doing and kind of referencing the, the governor's Ad Astra plan, Sedgwick County's metrics were currently in phase two. And the reasoning behind that, um, through kind of last week, we had 122 new cases. We had nine new hospitalizations, but uh, thankfully had zero deaths. And if you're interested in kind of monitoring our metrics, we do update them on our website um, at the link that Susan provided below. Can you clarify anything on this, Chris, uh, about where we're at as a, as a phase for our if, if you or, or Adrian, just that, that little thing is in the way, Kaylee, that little window up there. I don't know, I can't see it, but <laughs> it's just uh, there may be some indication that uh, the county is in phase three, but our metrics are saying we're in phase two. Yeah. Yeah, no, we're, we're solidly um, definitely in, in phase two right now. Other, other areas may be further, but for Sedgwick County specifically, we are in, in phase two. Right, thank you. Okay, so with that, we're in phase two, as we clearly stated, but what does that mean for long-term care facilities and adult care homes? That means a lot regarding visitations, and that visitation is generally prohibited uh, while in phase two, except for compassionate care situations. However, one thing to remember is that it's exclusively to end of life situations. There's a little bit more flexibility over that in a, in a few minutes. So um, in those limited situations where you are allowing for those visits due to compassionate care, visitors must be screened and additional precautions are to be taken, including uh, social distancing, you have to make sure that you're following that six foot distance, hand hygiene, appropriate uh, sanitation, and all visitors must wear a cloth face covering or face mask for a duration of their visit. So when Sedgwick County moves to phase three, and this is uh, important as you do your plans, in-person in visits to long-term care facilities and adult care homes, of course, can be reinstated still there are some restrictions on that. So you need to develop and make available to families and residents a plan for reopening so that this is clearly communicated to, to everyone. You will continue the screening measures and continue strict protocols, including the, the hand hygiene, requiring cloth masks and social distancing. So as you look at this and plan for the future, you need to establish a visitation plan and some things to consider when you're working on that plan is what will be your days and hours for visitation. You need to set those that uh, are appropriate for your individual facility and what works for you and your staffing. Uh, what scheduling visits? So you need to figure out how you're going to do that and communicate that with everybody, um, the visitors. 
what will be your PPE requirements for visitors and residents? Of course, they will be required to wear masks, but will you provide them or will you require the family and the visitors to provide that for themselves? That also needs to be in your plan and clearly communicated. You need to have, of course, screening for visitors and have that in place and what that will look like, what kind of um, screening questions will you use. And again, that social distancing and hand hygiene requirements needs to be in your plan and clearly stated. So how will you be, what's your process for communication of the plan with residents and family members? How will you get that? And then you need to look at what type of visitation you will be allowing. So there's multiple options out there. Uh, there's, um, but some things to, to look at is the patio, the private room, a residence room at the door, in the lobby. Uh, will that be virtual? So how will you uh, have those visits in your plan? Then how many visitors will be allowed during a visitation session? Set that. Will there be limits on the number of visits allowed per week per resident? Then you need to consider a reporting requirement for, for visitors. So if they have subsequent illness within seven days of the visit, uh, have them report both to the facility and the health department if they test positive. And then look at establish your criteria for compassionate care visits. So CMS frequently asked questions on June 23, 2020. And these are just a couple of points out of those FAQs. A compassionate care situation does not exclusively refer to end-of-life situations. Uh, there's been concerns um, across the nation that those, um, sometimes that's only how they're being interpreted. CMS states that they cannot define each situation that may constitute a compassionate care situation. That's why it's up to the facility to really flesh that out. But you can consult with state leadership, families, and ombudsmen to help determine if a visit should be conducted for compassionate care. So kind of including uh, families and talking to others about what might that, that might look like. So the, as I said, the reopening limited flexibility for controlled visitation prior to phase three. Uh, facilities can create spaces for residents without COVID-19, including those who have fully recovered to participate in outdoor sessions. And we've seen some examples across the country, such as in courtyards, in patios, even in parking lots. So as I said, uh, updated compassionate care FAQs, um, there's a link for that. And if you need any technical assistance, Central Plains Area Agency on Aging, we have uh, lots of resources and have, can, have done research and out various state and different models. So we are available at 855-200-2372 to assist with that. And we will be posting a packet of resources on our website, which is cpaa.org. So you need to also establish a mitigation plan that demonstrates the phased in approach your facility is taking, uh, which would include slowly relaxing the restrictions, COVID-19 testing of staff and residents. There is guidance from CDC on that and uh, how to handle positive COVID-19 results. So those are all uh, information that's in, included in resources. We have a resource page at the end of the presentation with the web addresses for those as well. So for that testing, you do need to use qualified staff to collect samples. Um, those would be staff that are trained on how to do that. And if your facility does not have qualified staff, uh, you can work with the healthcare provider to collect samples. Uh, if assistance is needed, please contact the Central County Health Department. You will also need a laboratory to conduct the COVID-19 data. So in your plan, you should also consider the facility continuity of operations and infection control policy, uh, which is based on the level of community transmission. Each plan is a facility facility plan. So that's a lot of this, of course, will determine on your staffing and what's going on with your and how you can and do these reopening plans and the visitation plans. So just to repeat that today's places a requirement for the Cedric County Health Officer to review a facility's reopening plan. 
It's a, uh, okay, CMS does recommend additional criteria for reopening nursing homes. Uh, nursing homes should not advance through any phases of reopen, reopening or relaxing restriction until all residents and staff have received the baseline test and appropriate actions are taken based on results. Now, let me clarify that. That is best practice guidance. That is not a requirement. You do not have to have the baseline. There is a recognition that's unacceptable for many. So that's just a best practice recommendation and not a requirement. So other recommendations from CMS are nursing homes that do experience a COVID-19 outbreak uh, prior to reopening must ensure the facility is adequately preventing transmission of COVID-19. That can include um, ensuring that proper testing is being done, that you are uh, cohorting positive residents away from negative residents, um, that uh, staff is being used and not transmitting, um, not having staff working with positive residents and also working with negative residents, um, as well as other uh, kind of general The nursing homes um, reopening should lag behind the general community's reopening by about 14 days. And that 14 days is selected because that's the incubation period for COVID-19. Um, and nursing homes do not begin to de-escalate or relax restrictions until their surrounding communi community satisfies gating criteria and enters into phase two. The nursing home should also spend a minimum of 14 days in any given phase with no new nursing home onset of COVID-19 cases prior to advancing to the next phase. And phase one retains the highest level of vigilance and mitigation of the plan. The nursing home may be in a different phase than its surrounding community based on a variety of things, including the status of COVID-19 inside the facility and the availability of key elements to prevent transmission, such as PPE, testing, and staffing. If at any time the nursing home identifies a new resident that has COVID-19, while in any phase, the facility thus then must go back to the highest level of mitigation, which is phase one, and start over even if the community is in a later phase like phase three. Before a nursing home can relax any restrictions, the facility must wait 28 days after the last COVID-19 case recovers. What that means is, for any outbreak or any case, you have to go two incubation periods or two 14-day periods before you're allowed to move on um, and relax restrictions. So when we look at CMS reopening and CDC testing guidelines and recommendations, uh, CMS reopening recommendations are, again, that and residents receive baseline testing and weekly testing thereafter. However, this, again, is not a requirement. It's just a recommendation. And if you want to view the latest uh, COVID-19 testing guidance from CDC, you can uh, go to the CDC's website, which, again, Susan has uh, provided to you on the slide. All right, so I know we have received some questions, so we will start with those. Um, and then if you have additional questions, feel free to uh, raise your hand or enter them into the chat box. All right, so the first question is, would wearing the face shield be better for staff to wear, or are they good to prevent possible residents? So our recommendation would be to wear um, cloth face masks or um, or other um, surgical masks if, um, in, the, in the facility. If that is not feasible, then face shields could potentially be worn, but not recommended if you're going to close contact with any of your residents. Kaylee, part of the guidance uh, indicated that uh, for a special COVID-19 unit, the staff in there involved with those residents should possibly wear the, the full shield. Yes. And because uh, they're in that unit all day and servicing people mm -hmm. within there all day. So that was one of the recommendations as, as a guidance. Yeah. If you are um, have COVID-19 uh, COVID in your facility, the recommendation is going to be that you wear uh, full uh, droplet precautions for, for COVID-19, which is going to be an N95 respirator, a face shield or goggles, and a gloves and an isolation gown of some sort 
excuse me, transmission uh, from the resident to your staff and also from your staff to other residents. Um, the next is this, uh, will the slides be available via email to attendees? Yes, we can, um, we're recording it and can also provide the slides after the webinar. We'll email the uh, slides, uh, the recording of the slides will be posted on our social media website. If you get them up there, I'll be glad to send a link uh, to the, everyone so they know it's up there and they'll be able to view it there. Um, the next question is if visitors wear N95 masks, are they required um, to keep six feet distance from their loved ones when visiting their hospice loved ones? Um, most uh, visitors will not have N95 masks. To wear an N95 mask, you need to be fit tested to ensure that it fits you properly. Um, and they're really being saved for medical personnel um, on the front lines. Um, if they are wearing a mask, I'll uh, let Annette kind of speak to the uh, hospice side of things. So there's not a lot of detail about that. They don't really go into that guidance. They say that compassionate care visits can happen. My understanding, I, I can check on this some more, but what I've understood that in those situations that they do allow um, that you don't have to maintain the six foot social distancing in those kind of medical situations. But we definitely need to have cloth masks on. Yes and have the proper hygiene and the room clean before and after and all of those PPE in place. That would be the facility needs to certainly have that in place and those requirements like where that visit would happen and how the screening would be done pre and post uh, and to contain that so there was no other contact with other individuals in that facility. Uh, the next when will Sedgwick County anticipating moving to stage three? Um, based on the way our numbers are, uh, it's hard to say. We look at the metrics um, every week and, and review them and see how they are changing. And based on our current status and the direction we're going with increases in cases, um, I don't anticipate us moving soon to phase three. And the, the recommendations made by our health officer, Dr. Menz, yesterday um, were three things, masks and uh, guidance for businesses, which not that one flies, but, uh, and also that there not be any events that have, that have other states coming in. So it, it just lets you know that we're looking at, the recommendation would be for there to be some restrictions put in place uh, the commissioners will vote on that next Wednesday, and I, I don't honestly know if we will have three votes uh, for that or not. But regardless of how that uh, how that vote turns out, those are still the public health recommendations. Just letting you know that we are very concerned about the numbers, uh, how they're going in our community, um, other clusters occurring in nursing homes. The next question is, will the health department do all resident testing if we have an active resident or staff member? Yes, if a uh, case is identified of in one of your residents or in your staff, you can uh, contact them at the health, uh, the health department and we will coordinate to do testing of all your, of your residents. Um, we have a team that will go out and assist with that testing and then we can, we'll work to coordinate getting your staff tested uh, through 211 with the health department. Um, next question is, what is the guidance for allowing hairdressers into facilities? Uh, under phase two, which we're in, that is not allowed. They are not allowed to bring in outside uh, visitors or uh, personnel that are not health and, and critical, critical staff. So that is not allowed in phase three. That, in phase three, that would be allowed. So, uh, question. Uh, regarding the guidance from CDC and CMS allowing. So under the FAQs, CMS FAQs, it did mention that uh, outside visits would be, so like that's where allowing some flexibility in the visitation to make sure that they were maintaining the physical distance, the cloth mask, the PPE, that facilities could establish some limited um, 
visitation such as patio or um, patio or, or in the parking lot, those kind of things. So that, that is um, in the CMS FAQ. The next question, um, I'm, so it's probably again for Annette, what about foot care for diabetic residents by an APRN? That would be a medical, uh, a medical per personnel, so I believe that would be allowed, but each facility needs to make that decision based on their uh, individual facility and their plan. Um, I'm not seeing any other additional questions in the chat. Um, so if you do, again, have questions, please go ahead and type those in um, or raise your hand. And kind of while you are thinking on those, um, we do, again, have resources that are available uh, that you can, when you get the slides, go to these links to see the CDC guidance, uh, the CMS guidance, uh, KDHG's information, as well as the Central County Health Department's webpage. I know that one of the recommendations that Dr. Mintz had mentioned on a different day was uh, taking someone, there being a staff person to take like temper, uh, temperatures before everybody, walk, before everyone enters the, the building. So that was one recommendation and we know there's lots of things for you to consider like how do you handle the scheduling of people for those compassionate care visits, uh, and how you do that's going to be up to you as far as making appointments, uh, because it really depends upon your facility and your staffing. And we, we know that no facility has uh, extra staffing, so that that is, that is a challenge, but that these are just some important things to consider as you look at those compassionate care visits. Right. Um, the next question was, how often will you provide updates to us? I'm not sure exactly what specific updates um, you're referencing, but the, the metrics and kind of where we're at as a county, we update those weekly on the uh, the county's web page. Um, specific to guidance, okay, how many what, often will we do webinars like this one? Well, um, give us an idea when, when you're writing that and if anyone has similar thoughts, um, how how often would a webinar be helpful for us to have a Q&A time with you? Anything else? All right. We will um, take that into advisement and um, we'll see uh, what we can do to in, um, ensure that we're getting, uh, getting your needs met. Yes, because one, one of the things that, that we could consider doing if it would be helpful for, uh, to any of you is if, if there are, if you have plans that you feel uh, that are pretty strong that we could share as an example, we could take your facility name off of it. And that is something that we could do on a weekly call, that we could schedule an hour and uh, review something like that with you, or if there are particular topics that you would like us to, re you know, to review or cover with you, uh, we could also do that as well. The next question, so no individual review of facility reopening plans, meaning is what is served as a review from the health department, that is correct. It, it does. If, if there, uh, and I know there's a lot of people on this call, but if, if there's a, a particular question you have or something or a portion you really want reviewed, then let us know and we, we can uh, talk with you about that. And the next question, what is the turnaround time once someone is swabbed? Um, it depends on where they go to get tested and kind of what lab is being used, but um, it, it usually around, um, four or five days, four or five days, but could it be up to seven right now? Um, but, so we uh, tend to tell people up to seven business days, but you may get it back sooner than that. And I know that, that, that that's really frustrating and it's been frustrating for us. And we have to use a variety of labs, 
depending upon symptoms or how many symptoms. So the state laboratory, Cahill, they process any samples that have two symptoms connected with uh, the sample, and they do a fairly good job of uh, turning, giving that back to us in like 48 or so hours so that we're able to get back with people in 72. That's if everything runs perfectly. Uh, and then there's other labs, commercial labs, we use so that we can define what someone has that will test, and it is either no symptoms or one symptom. So anyone that has one or none, then we have to send to one of the commercial labs. Those are the ones that we tend to have a little bit um, more variance with because one of the ones we use, one of their machines just went down again, and that put the results getting it postponed the results getting back to us for about five, six days. So we were a week out with getting back to people, and it's really frustrating. Okay. Um, next question is, what is the possibility of COVID being spread in Home Plus because of ventilation systems like air conditioners? Um, there, um, I'm not the expert on this, so um, if you would like to put your your message into, or your email into the, the chat, I can have our uh, person who knows a little bit more about, about it reach out to you. Um, but I know there is considerations of, like when you're isolating and quarantining people of, of airflow and ventilation systems because there is some potential uh, risk for that. And have you, met, have you read much about that, Dr. Menz, as far as it spreading through ventilation? But you would have to have a somebody that was positive in order for it to be spread, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. so if you have somebody in your Homes Plus that, that has COVID-19, uh, Homes Plus are typically pretty small, so uh, right there is your risk situation, which would then require that you have everybody in that home tested and all staff or all the owners or everybody who works there have to be tested. So, so what, what Dr. Menz had said was it's going to be less so in a facility as opposed to a hospital where there's procedures occurring, where there's uh, aerosolized, intubation, intubation yes, like in, in, intubations and whatnot, where, where there's going to be more uh, virus in, in the air. Next question, can we be kept up to date of all facilities who currently have a cluster? So the health department does work with any facility that has a cluster to uh, put out a, a joint press release with them when that does happen. Um, and then we keep current cluster numbers and uh, active cases, number of clusters, number that have closed on our Central County website um, and on our dashboard. So you can see kind of what the, the number of active cases are um, on our website, but we don't typically put out the names other than kind of in those press releases. Would you be able to send out the questions asked and the answers you gave? Yes, it's all in the recording, um, but we can definitely keep track of kind of what the questions were and do a, a written um, like a, a questions document. Okay. So on the FAQ from for reopening guidance from KDAD, there is a question asking if a contracted beautician is considered an essential staff. Their answer was that facilities are responsible for designating essential staff in accordance with their infection control policy. Is Cedric County following the same guidance? I'll turn that over to you. The same guidance as far as what? As I mean, far as Katie, I, I... Well, because currently we, we don't have uh, businesses separated by essential or non-essential. So, uh, I have not seen that uh, FAQ. I apologize, I had not seen that regarding a contracted beautician. So I guess if KDAD says it's up to you to decide, then it's up to you to decide. And if a facility, again, remember that each individual facility is responsible to make their plan and it's going to be based on their specific situation about uh, who they let in and if they're going to deem that person an essential staff. All right, next question. Do all positive results go to the Cedric County Health Department? How is that tracing completed? 
we will get all positive results on um, any Cedric County residents. So the, the residents of your facility, yes. Um, your staff, if they do not live in Cedric County, we won't see those, but we do work with other counties to get those. Um, when a um, positive does happen in, in a facility, whether it's a staff or a resident, what we're going to ask is that you uh, provide us with the information on that, that staff. We have an established line list. Um, some of you may have, have seen these with other outbreaks like flu or uh, GI illness. We're going to ask for just onset date, information about symptoms, information about hospitalization. And so we're going to ask you to fill that out to track which of your, um, your residents or your staff are being tested, who's tested positive, kind of who's tested negative. And that helps us keep track of kind of what's going on in your facility. And then we also um, will work with you to identify where um, the residents may have gone or if it's the staff, is it a specific kind of wing that that person went to, and, and try to figure out where the risk in your facility may be and how to mitigate that. The next question is, since so many staff work at multiple facilities, can we get a list of cluster buildings? And like I said, we only release out um, from those media releases. We don't keep a list um, on our website anywhere of where those clusters are. Uh, next question is, you mentioned CMS's guidance on outdoor visits. Is this something we can do in phase two? So I did attach the CMS guidance. You have the link to that, and, and that is for your review and interpretation as a facility. Uh, as I said, in that uh, FAQ that was just released on June 23rd, it did reference that flexibility. But and you also, and that had, uh, when referencing that new addition, uh, connected it to compassionate care visits and, or not just compassionate care, but looking at uh, options such as parking lot. Right. So it's not saying open up your doors to visitors. No but be very specific and uh, thoughtful, um, structured about how this happened. It was not indoor visitation at all that they referenced. It was outdoor and it was very structured and very planned. Uh, so again, please review the, FM, the FAQs from CMS, but again, you're still going to be up to each individual facility because you still are responsible, of course, as you know, to mitigate the risk and ensure non-transmission. So it was very limited. And the next question is, what is the NHNS website that has information reported by nursing homes? Um, I'm not um, sure what that is referencing, that website. Um, so um, if you could maybe expound on, on what you're, you're mentioning, we can try to get that one answered. Um, the next question, if you complete the form on Kansas Reportable Disease Portal, do we still need to call the Cedric County Health Department? Um, we do ask that you still let us know, but we do get those, that information when you do um, report to KDHE. Uh, we do still get that information. We can just kind of help you a little bit faster if you uh, call us as well. Um, next question, what about dining if following restrictions? I'm not sure what that question is. I'm not sure what that means. If what about dining? Uh, Are you talking like in-person large, large group dining, or um, right. like what? What specifically are you referencing? Group dining. So. I think as long as you're maintaining um, proper social distancing um, between residents and that uh, is what the guidance says. Yeah, and, right. and yep. mitigating the risk, then I think that would would be okay. And as long as you're not um, symptomatic in the dining room, right? And that would be in the guidance, and it does require that social distancing. No, have to do that. Yes. And yeah, no one with symptoms. Right. And uh, with going back to one of your questions about staff uh, working at multiple facilities. I think it would be important to create a policy that requires traveling staff to report to each facility that they work in 
uh, if they have a positive, if, if they are positive. So um, we did get some clarification on on the the, Nash, the NHSN um, website. We will send that link out um, in the uh, with the recording as well um, for that. So the, uh, what link is that? So we will make sure you get that link in the, in the along with the slide. Um, next question: Can facilities have a policy to keep staff from working at multiple facilities? That would be an individual facility decision. But it might be. Um, I'm going to say that that would be up to you to kind of set that policy. But um, one thing that could assist you is is knowing kind of where your staff are working. If, if they are working just for you, then you could have an idea of where else they all are. Um, and kind of that can help you be prepared if, if something does happen. Um, are there other questions? Was there anything else that you wanted to talk about or mention? I, I already mentioned the uh, temporal, taking a temperature before anybody walks into the facility. Any other thoughts you had on that or anything? You can, if you can. Okay. If you're checking people's temperature, a lot of places are doing it, the hospitals are doing that, so I think since these facilities are so susceptible when they get a case, it would be nice if you could screen your staff every time they come to work. They have a temperature, they probably shouldn't be coming in that day, just getting an idea. If there's any construction people or any other type of visitor coming in for repair or something or something, I think they should be checked too. So Anybody potentially bringing something in, there should be some minimal check. Temperature, maybe a couple quick questions. Uh, maybe similar to what our house is. Thank you, Dr. Mitten. Mm -hmm. All right, are there any other um, questions before we conclude? We'll give you a few more minutes to put any questions you have in the chat. Any more questions? So, thank you everyone for joining us today, and we will kind of leave the line open here for just a few minutes in case anyone has any final questions for us. So, we do have a question about CDC guidance on therapy dogs. Um, I the Recommendations in general for, for animal contact is to make sure that uh, you're washing your hands before and after you have contact with animals. But I would say you would probably have to um, consider whether the person bringing the animal in um, would be more of a risk, I think, than the actual the animal itself. But I don't know that there's any specific guidance for therapy dogs um, that I've seen. Oh, okay. It just the CDC just posted something recently and uh, don't let your dog be sleep in your bed with you and things like that. And don't uh, feed your dog and eat with the, your fork and give your dog a bite, things like that. So we tend to be very, uh, they're like our family, so we want to make them feel that way and it's probably recommend, it's recommended not to do that at this time. So we'll, we'll post or make, make a reference to that document as well. 
Um, there's a question, are home plus required to report to the CDC website um, for staff, residents, PPE, et cetera, or can we be fined if not completed? So nursing home, uh, nursing homes are required, but homes plus don't fall under the same guidance as um, a homes plus doesn't fall under the same guidance as a nursing home. So, so some of this is specific to nursing homes, where a skilled nursing facilities and and some of it does not apply to the other adult care homes. KDAD did reference that there is supposed to be something for specifically for Home Plus. I haven't seen that, but there should be something out there. Um, confirm, no, confirming that participation in this call meets the KDAD's expectation for consultation with the county health officer and department. Yes, that is correct. Well, just to clarify, certainly you do all have to report any confirmed cases. Yes. So that is, that is a requirement for everybody. That is uh, required by everybody that you report any confirmed cases okay. that you have of a resident or staff of COVID-19. Appreciate the amount of um, <clears throat> pressure that you must be getting from families and loved ones that want into your facilities, but um, the, our, our numbers, we, we went up 10% today from yesterday. So it's just, it's not a good time, so just be, and, I, and we know that, that we're preaching to the choir that you're going to be very careful and thoughtful because one case in a resident of a resident in a nursing home, uh, it doesn't typically stay just one case. And these patients are very fragile and with the highest mortality rates in the Yeah. It's not just a bad cold in this Well, and that's why that recommendation is that, that this would be the last place where reopening would occur is with this population and these facilities that are uh, in Homes Plus, adult care homes, and nursing facilities where it is uh, the high-risk population and just a, a group environment puts, puts more people at risk. Um, there's a question, will we send out new guidelines explaining we don't need to send in a plan? Um, we will um, include in the, with the recording that's the, attending this recording meets that requirement. As per the amount. Yeah. Yeah, well, we'll make sure that's included in the email you get so you can document that um, for, for KDES. Well, like I said, we will stay here for a few more minutes in case there's any additional questions. Um, but if there are not, again, thank you everyone for participating. And thank you for the clarification on the reporting requirements because um, we're not completely up to date on CDC and adult care homes, homes plus. So thank you for that clarification on the requirements for that. All right, um, are there guidelines on taking new admission? Um, is there are um, specific guidelines for taking new admissions depending on um, kind of where you're at in your reopening and also whether or not you have a case. Um, but I don't know, is, is that KDAS that has those or? KDAS and CMS is where they, yeah, look at KDAS and CMS that have the guidelines for, re for new admissions. And then how will we know when we have entered um, into phase three? I'm sure you, the, that will be well reported out um, amongst the, the media and, and everyone when that happens.
Our, our recommendation probably be, you know, this is really hard, because originally when we had the Ad Astra plan, that even though those dates were not meant to be uh, set dates, and it was at, at the, uh, I forget how it was phrased, but at the earliest it'll be July 8th, at the earliest it will be whatever, and a lot of people really grabbed a hold of those dates as being the end date, and where we are with our cases clean, um, wouldn't even guess whether it be uh, August 1st, September 1st. So if, if you, and I, I know that's really hard because phase three is different from phase two in regards to what you do, but right now this is where we are. Uh, with the social distancing continuing to be paramount and masks and just uh, for all of you in this difficult uh, role to really limit who comes into your facilities and taking specific precautions uh, with those who do. So the question um, is: the testing offered by 211 nasopharyngeal? Yeah, the health department testing is uh, nasopharyngeal swabs. Yes. Um, so we have a question, masks is required in public as of Friday, but I had a staff member tell me county isn't enforcing it. How do I um, enforce them to wear masks in public? How, how do you enforce who, the, the staff or your residents? And uh, it can be a requirement of your facility. So even if the, even if the county uh, would decide uh, next Wednesday uh, not to have an order or not to really um, strongly recommend masks, um, any facility uh, or business, you know, just like uh, here at the health department, we all have to have a mask on if we're within six feet of each other. We can't be outside of six feet, and even though we can be in here, masks on. So, that can be a requirement of your facility. So it doesn't need to be a recommend, it doesn't have to be uh, an order with the county or enforceable by the county for your facility to be able to have that. There are a handful of businesses I've been to that have a sign in the door, wear a mask or don't come in. And there's no issue about six foot or anything. Don't come in if you don't want to wear a mask. Yep. That's their right. They are leasing that space or they own that space, they can set the rules. In some sense, that's better than the county trying to enforce it. It's you, that is your space. And you can tell them you're not coming in here without it. All right, if a resident needs to leave the facility for medical needs, how long should they be isolated in their room? Um, if they're going somewhere where they could be at risk for exposure, 
and you think there could have been exposure, the recommendation is to keep for 14 days. There is guidance uh, when somebody is in a facility and they have to go out regularly for analysis. There is guidance on uh, how they're uh, people are isolated or kept apart. So there is information and guidance on that. So I think it does depend on the visit where they're right. going to. Right. They're going to a doctor's appointment versus. They're going out on a public visit right. out in the community. That right, and that, so the, as a facility, you would have to determine was there a risk, potential risk for that person to to have been exposed um, in that case. visit. Mm -hmm. So if you have additional questions, um, you should have all received the, an invitation from Susan Lee here at the Health Department. If you have additional questions, you can email her, um, and we can put her email in the, the chat box for you. It is um, Susan Dotley. Yeah. But if you have any additional questions, you can re uh, send them to her, and she will make sure that uh, they get answered. All right. Um, if there's no additional questions. Uh, thank you, everyone, for again participating. Thank you all very much for joining in on today, and thanks for all the great questions. Yep. Thank you. We appreciate your time. <laughs>